Max Highlights, and here's your host, Anne O'Donnell. Hello, and a very warm welcome to your Max. Let's have a look at the week's highlights. Up north, why Scandinavian cuisine is so popular. Up close, how Ingo Arndt takes his amazing wildlife photos. And up and away, what the Spanish island Gran Canaria has to offer visitors. Well, the Michelin Guide is one of the world's most recognised gastronomy guides. Earlier this week, they published their first ever Nordic Countries edition. Scandinavian cuisine has undergone a lot of experimentation over the past 10 years. And the result is a unique, yet still traditional and slightly savoury version of haute cuisine. As the book comes out, we went to explore some of their restaurants. There's a new culinary star in Copenhagen's harbour. Studio, part of the standard restaurant group, has received a coveted Michelin star. And this is the man who owned it, Chef Torsten Wiedgaard. He's devoted to Danish cooking traditions and ingredients, and he adds to that international avant-garde cuisine. But the focus is definitely Scandinavian. We're super proud of the vegetables, the shellfish and fishes we have here. I actually think they're some of the best in the world. If they're grown by the right people, or been taken up by the right people, if you go out and catch a fish. Uh, the meat is amazing, uh, because our temperatures are a little bit slower, so yeah, you probably heard it before, but you know, things grow s slower and develop, develop more taste. High quality ingredients from the Nordic region. That is typical of gourmet restaurants throughout Scandinavia, like here in the Norwegian capital, Oslo. The restaurant Lofoten is famous for its seafood dishes. Nordic haute cuisine deliberately maintains a distance from French or Mediterranean cooking, and therein lies its recipe for success. The Swedish capital Stockholm has also seen a boom in Scandinavian cooking. The restaurant Proviant, for instance, offers specialties like rhubarb sorbet. Danish restaurant critic Søren Frank has been in the business for 20 years. He explains what has made Nordic culinary culture such a success over the past decade. I think in many ways that, that the new Nordic cuisine, or which is actually the Noma cuisine, came in the right spot. Uh, after the, the Mediterranean cuisine, of course, but also the, the way that it was like eating local, which is sustainable, uh, uh, which very much like a political trend that a lot of the consumers were, were ready to, to accept and, 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 and to relate to. It was Copenhagen's restaurant Noma that first picked up on the trend. Its chef and co-owner René Redzepi, who has earned two Michelin stars for Noma, uses exclusively Scandinavian ingredients. Back in 2003, that was a sensation. Later, Noma was named world's best restaurant for three years running. It was just a wave that exploded because, you know, it's like tossing a, a stone into water. The rings became bigger and bigger. And the whole philosophy of looking at what you have around you just became, became a su huge success in the... Uh, how you say, the inspiration for a lot of chefs all over the world. The founder of both Noma and The Standard is Klaus Meyer. He's considered a pioneer of the new Scandinavian cuisine, and he says it all began with a question. Why, with a distinct climate, with distinct products, why should we not be able to have a firm, uh, definable uh, cuisine? The big trouble, I mean, the challenge was not the concept, the challenge was to make that come true on the plate. And Klaus Meyer and his Danish colleagues have succeeded. Today, Copenhagen, with its 16 Michelin-starred restaurants, is Scandinavia's culinary magnet. This year, Søren Ledet's Geranium was able to successfully defend its two stars. It meant a lot to us, uh, uh, both booking guest-wise um, more security and uh, for the staff as well. I mean, when you have a star, it's, it's for the rest of the world and for the people who read the guide to know that what you do is actually worth the guests' while and their time to go there. Back at studio, as every evening, all 48 places are booked out.
it's not a trend anymore. It's uh, it's a fact. The shifts, having this limitation, um, becomes much stronger in their gastronomic language. Nordic haute cuisine, both hearty and light, both traditional and experimental. Cuisine that captures the taste of today. Well, if I turn this sculpture around, you'll probably get a better look at the detail inside where the shell has been cut away here. Now, this is a hornet's nest and it's not man-made. It is fascinating, though, what the hornets have achieved here. And there are many other animals and insects creating jaw-dropping pieces of architecture. Photographer Ingo Arndt wants to help protect species on our planet by drawing people's attention to what they can do. He has just released two more photo books to help with this campaign, one on animal architecture and the other on coastal bears. We're approaching Lake Clark National Park in Alaska. Ingo Arndt is on the lookout for grizzly bears. The German wildlife photographer has made eight trips in all to Alaska. For his new book, he wanted to depict the bears at different times of the year. This time he netted several hundred pictures. They document Arndt's fascination with the majestic creatures. The first thing you notice is their size. When you're standing 20 or 30 meters away from a grizzly, you're basically at its mercy. That's an amazing experience. They're also very handsome animals, especially when they've just come out of hibernation, and they still have their winter coat and those round faces. The photos capture the grizzlies in their natural environment, with their cubs in the short months of summer and fishing for salmon. There are even some close-ups. An adult grizzly can weigh up to 700 kilos. To get up close and personal, Aunt designed a remote-controlled vehicle for his camera. The challenge was coming up with something new and different. Bears are beautiful, and everyone likes them, so they're popular with photographers. And every wildlife photographer dreams of shooting a grizzly. There are tons of good pictures out there, and I had to top them. Throughout his career, Ingo Arndt has always sought new perspectives. His previous project explored the marvels of animal architecture like these termite towers in northern Australia. Or the elaborate structures woven by caterpillars. Everything has a new story to tell. It doesn't always have to be the elephant or the grizzly. It can also be an ant or a butterfly. There are so many fascinating things to discover, especially at the macro level. That's where you'll often see something new and surprising. For this book, Arndt even took some photos indoors, for him a real exception. He found his subjects at the Museum of Natural History in Frankfurt. Working in the studio, he could capture the objects with the sharpest of detail. Sometimes it's nice to take pictures of things that don't run away from you. In the studio, I can take my time and set up the shot. Then the challenge becomes bridging the gap between the studio and the wilderness, like the rainforest of West Papua, for example. Out in the wild, local residents and researchers help him track down the animals. Then it's time to wait. Sometimes Aunt spends weeks lying in ambush. The name of the game is persistence, patience, and the perfect camouflage. I spent a lot of time in the forest as a kid, watching the kingfishers while everyone else was out at the disco. Pretty soon I decided to become a nature photographer. I stuck with it, and eventually it all worked out. But I had plenty of lean times along the way. Today, Ingo Arndt is one of only about a dozen full-time professional wildlife photographers in Germany. His works are displayed in museums and galleries. 
One exhibition called Animal Kingdom showcases photos of animals that form swarms, herds and colonies. It's been touring Europe for three years now. I want to show people what still exists, what it is that we have to preserve and protect. I hope my work can make a contribution to that. Ingo Arndt's next expedition will take him to Africa and North and South America over the course of nine months. Well, Spain's Canary Islands are a popular tourist destination all year round. And Gran Canaria Island attracts nearly 3 million visitors every year. Euromax travels from the north to the south of Gran Canaria to bring you a taste of what it has to offer from the sun to the sea and everything that lies in between. The three kilometer long city beach of Las Palmas 380,000 people live in the capital of the Canary Islands. Average temperatures here range between 15 to 27 degrees Celsius all year round, despite the skies being almost always cloudy. It's a phenomenon locals call panza de burro, donkey stomach. Most of the people here are descendants of the indigenous Guanches and the Spanish conquerors who came in the 15th century. Juan Manuel is proud to be a true Canario. For three years now, he's been co-owner of the restaurant El Molinet, located right on the beachfront. We Canarios are very warm-hearted and open. Our doors are always open to everyone. That's the way the Canarios are. We're islanders and we're a good people. Moist trade winds ensure that the northern part of the island is densely forested and green. The journey to the interior takes in authentic villages off the usual tourist track. The town of Terror has the typical Canarian carved wood balconies. Its church, Nuestra Señora del Pino, Our Lady of the Pine, is the island's main place of pilgrimage. 20 kilometers to the south is the Cross of Tejeda, Standing at an altitude of 1,500 meters, it marks the geographic midpoint of the island. On weekends, it's a popular spot with day trippers from Las Palmas. This place was always a major crossroads. In the summer, it used to be a place where the herders passed with their goats and sheep. Today, it's an important traffic junction. Lots of the paths used by hikers and mountain climbers come together here. A favorite destination for hikers and the symbol of Gran Canaria is at an elevation of 1,800 meters, the Roque Nublo or Cloudy Rock. It's the remains of a volcanic eruption. Right next to it is the smaller Roque Fraile, the friar. On a clear day, there's a view of Mount Teide on the neighboring island of Tenerife. Like all the Canary Islands, Gran Canaria is volcanic in origin. This is our first time in Gran Canaria. The weather's fantastic and the view's very impressive. We can even see over to Tenerife. It's fantastic. We have the ocean, the mountains, the Roque Nublo here. It's just wonderful. It's a privileged place with an absolutely fabulous view. What impresses me most is the different landscape forms you encounter on the way up to the base of the Roque Noblo. At the foot of the mountain is the village of Tejeda, said to be one of the loveliest on the island. The municipality Tejeda boasts three museums. The Museum of History and Traditions devotes part of its collection to the almond, the most important product of the region. Olivia Sosa Denis's family has lived in the region for generations. Almond farming plays a very important role in the history of this municipality. It begins in August and September with two different processes. The men beat the harvested almonds with eucalyptus branches, and the women and children gather them up. All the neighbors get together in the afternoon or evening to shell the nuts. And there's always Canarian music and dancing. 
On the southern tip of Gran Canaria are the dunes of Mas Palomas. The sand is mainly ground coral and seashells, washed out by the Atlantic. It's one of the most popular vacation spots on the island. Mas Palomas and the neighboring Playa del Inglés are hotel hotspots. The south of the island has the most sunshine, the longest beaches and gorgeous sunsets. Harold Glöckler is a German fashion designer with a difference. His shrill statement pieces are popular all over the world with anyone who wants to stand out in a crowd. He's expanding and he's just opened his first boutique here in Berlin, selling not only clothing, but furniture items and accessories as well. With his glitter, sparkles and makeup, there's no mistaking Harald Glöckler. The designer is ready to take the German capital by storm, flanked by American model Amanda Lepore. Gorgeous, magnificent, opulent and glamorous. I think that's something Berlin can deal with. What my customers love and what makes me who I am. The crowds were there at the opening of the Harald Glöckler Lifestyle Store in downtown Berlin, the first in the city. Fans can buy clothes, accessories, jewellery, perfume and beauty products in a 200 square meter large shop. The product range even caters to babies and dogs. Harald Glöckler wants to sell glamour at affordable prices, luxury for the masses, so to speak. The designs aren't ever likely to grace the catwalks of Paris or Milan, but the Prince of Pompeurs, his fashion label, couldn't care less. He's got plenty of fans. Anyone who's a bit of a diva likes to wear his designs. Like me. <laughs> the oils are very heavy, not to everyone's taste, not to mine. But he's got other nice things. Glöckler's career began in Stuttgart in southern Germany. He started off working at a clothes shop and then he bought a boutique of his own. He founded Pompeurs in 1990. The Italian actress Gina Lola Brigida was a fan from the very start. And Glöckler was quick to take advantage of the added attention her fame brought him. It's all about the orchestration. Fashion is a circus. And it's all about orchestration. And in my case, people love it. It's part of the concept. And I think... I think that it's this mixture of the perfect worker and perfect orchestration that fascinates people. Harold Glöckler has become a brand name with franchises all over the world. He also has his own show on the QVC shopping channel. His target audience is what he calls the normal woman. Normal women with a fairly extravagant taste in clothes. Glöckler also designs for other companies, bed linen and even motorbikes. He's also tried his luck at painting. But even he has his limits as to what he'll design. Coffins. I keep getting requests to design coffins, but I draw the line at funeral design. No, never. Instead, he wants to put all his energy into the land of the living. He's expanding and plans to open up shops in Munich and Baden-Baden very soon. When I first came to Germany, I was a bit surprised at the amount of cyclists I would see doing their daily commute and not just alone. Sometimes with one or two children in tow as well. Turns out Berlin is not alone. The cargo bike has taken off in many big cities, especially Copenhagen. It's rush hour in Copenhagen and Mats Lange is in the thick of it. He's bringing his son to school. Each day, he covers around 12 kilometers on his cargo bike. 
Commuting in in uh, in Copenhagen can be a very uh, time demanding, and if you have kids and you have to drop them off and pick them up, uh, it's much easier with the bike. And I can have two kids on it and uh, and groceries, and it's it's light and it's very quick. <coughs> This is where his cargo bike originated. Six years ago, Hans Folk and a friend created the first bullet bike. At the time, Folk worked as a carpenter and transported his materials using a heavy, old freight bicycle. So he decided to create a model that was quick and light. It's a common way to get around from A to B. It's a common way of transportation. So. The, car, the cargo bike feels natural for us because uh, it's, it's built over an old-fashioned design from Denmark called the Long John uh, that nobody renewed for like 60 years. So it was still a great bike, but we decided to do something about it and, and pimp it up, made it, make it like uh, it fitted into the 21st hundred century. So uh, this is a new version of the Long John. Copenhagen is one of the most bicycle-friendly cities in Europe. Freight bikes enjoy a long tradition here. Until the 1960s, they were a common mode of transport for making deliveries within the city. Back then, the bike couriers rode heavy models made of steel. Now, cargo bikes are making a comeback. It's estimated there are some 40,000 in use in Greater Copenhagen today. And their popularity is growing in other European cities too. Cities all around the world are now banking on the bicycle. They're looking at infrastructure, they're, they're really seeing this 19th century inventions as a solution to 21st century transport problems. So the bike is back, it's, uh, it's come back again to serve us as it used to 100 years ago. The cargo bike now we're seeing is this, this, new, uh, this new addition to the bike boom. Michael Colville Anderson is an urban mobility expert. He gives speeches around the world and advises cities on how they can become more bicycle friendly. He's a big fan of cargo bikes. Last year, he published a book called Cargo Bike Nation, featuring photos from Copenhagen and 33 other cities around the globe. It's not bicycle culture, it's vacuum cleaner culture. Everybody has a vacuum, they all use it, they don't fetishize it, you know. They just, they just, it's a tool to make our daily lives easier. But what I like is people on bicycles and the way that the bicycle is the most powerful tool in our urban toolboxes to make cities more livable. But these tools are taking on unconventional forms. The firm N55 has developed a bike frame using aluminum tubing, which buyers can assemble themselves. And coffee bikes, cafes on wheels, are already rolling around several European cities. Swiss firm Fretsche makes bikes with a sidecar, and folding bicycles have long been bestsellers, as they can easily be taken on public transport. It's, it's bicycle culture 2.0. You know, you, you see a diversity in the design of bicycles. Um, and, and, you know, the elderly gentleman on the tricycle, you know, he maybe does feels a little bit unstable on a regular bicycle, but boom, there's a bicycle for him. There's a bicycle for every need. In Copenhagen, bikes are increasingly replacing cars. In the Danish capital, there are now around five bikes for every car. The electric bike here is fantastic. Yeah. You can actually fit two kids and about three bags of groceries. Yeah, it's definitely my car. Yeah. So if inside Copenhagen, if I can ride my bike, I ride my bike. In Copenhagen, cargo bikes are giving cars a run for their money. And they could soon become a popular mode of transport in cities across Europe. Well, that is it from me, Anne O'Donnell, and the rest of the Euromax crew until tomorrow. Don't forget, you can head onto our website to revisit any of our reports again. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.